All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our first deeper dive session for the 2024 Majeska Simpkin School of Human Rights. Of course, I am Dr. Robert Green II, the lead instructor of the Majeska Simpkin School of Human Rights. And this afternoon, I am very pleased and happy to welcome to our class this, this afternoon, Dr. Justine Hill Edwards of the University of Virginia's Corcoran School Department of History. Now, Dr. Hill Edwards has uh, written two books, um, one of which we're gonna talk about in depth this afternoon. Um, her discussion this afternoon is derived from her first book, Unfree Markets, The Slaves Economy, and the rise of capitalism in South Carolina. This, of course, relates a great deal to what we discussed last week in terms of both indigenous and African histories in South Carolina um, in the pre and early colonial period. Um, and also Dr. Hill Edwards' second book that she's currently working on now uh, is titled Savings and Trust, The Rise and Betrayal of the Freedmen's Bank about the rise and fall of the Freedmen Savings and Trust Company. Might be able to have some time to ask her about that book as well. Uh, but again, uh, this afternoon, we are humbled to be able to walk, welcome Dr. Hill Edwards to our class. And on a personal note, I was able to meet her in person for the first time on Friday at the African American Intellectual History Society Conference that was held in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, so that was a, a thrill for two of us. So again, everyone, please welcome Dr. Justine Hill Edwards. Um, thank you, Professor Green, for the introduction. And this is a pleasure, it really is. Um, this is, I wanna say maybe the third time that I have presented here at the Majeska School. And it is a privilege to be with such like-minded people. And um, I'm excited about sharing just a little bit about the work that I completed in my first book, especially as it relates to a topic that I continue to be very interested in. Um, that's the history of South Carolina, but importantly, the history of slavery in South Carolina. So I wanna thank again, Professor Green, and I wanna thank Brett for inviting me to uh, share a little bit about the work and to fellowship a little bit as, as well. So I'm excited to be here. And with that, um, I'm just gonna share my screen and I will get started. Okay, I wanna make sure that everybody can see it. Um, and so again, um, this topic, really the topic of the history of South Carolina and the history of slavery in South Carolina has been with me for a while. Um, I decided to focus on South Carolina when I was doing my PhD. And there was some, something about the state that drew me to it. Um, I wasn't sure if it was the interesting history of rice or the history of slavery or really the lives of the hundreds of thousands of enslaved people who lived, labored, and died in South Carolina, but um, the state and the history of the state has drawn me for a really long time. And so that's why it was the foundation, the focus of my first book on free markets. And so in the years that I spent researching and writing my first book, uh, I realized that we can see the relationship between slavery and the evolution of capitalism, really the economic history of this nation, most clearly in South Carolina. Um, and this is particularly true if we look at the experiences of enslaved people. And so what I found in the archival record shows that South Carolina as a slaveholding colony and then state became a greeting ground for the type of economic enterprise that we would associate really, really with modern capitalism. From the rise of rice cultivation or Carolina gold to the cultivation of cotton, uh, South Carolina's economy was really the foundation for the nation's economy for much of the first two decades of this nation. And all of the backbreaking work that catapulted South Carolina to national and global prominence was done by the work of enslaved Africans and people of African descent, starting from the very establishment of the colony in 18, in 1670, excuse me. So that's gonna be my focus for this afternoon is to connect the histories of slavery and the history of capitalism in South Carolina. And so as Professor Green noted, um, I am a professor in the 
Department of History at the University of Virginia. And most of my work revolves around African-American history. But increasingly, um, I look at the intersection of slavery and capitalism. And now I look at what we like to call the afterlives of slavery, the continued influence of slavery in the lives of African-Americans um, and in particular, how slavery continues to in influence our major institutions. And for me now, that's banking. And so in many ways, the work that I completed in this first book, Unfree Markets. No yeah. problem. Good to see you. Oh, uh, looking at the intersection of slavery and capitalism and really the economic history of slavery from the perspective of the enslaved themselves has really um, help me better understand my current work on the Freedmen's Bank. So, and again, I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A, but let's get started. Uh, let's see, okay. So the economy of slavery began in South Carolina's colonial period, really from the founding of the colony in 1670. And South Carolina is interesting for a variety of reasons. First, because it was founded as the first slaveholding colony in the American colonies, then states that would become the United States. And second, because it was the first state to secede from the Union after Lincoln's election as president in 1860. And so if we think about the beginning of South Carolina's history and this major rupture in 1860, right before the outbreak of the Civil War, we see that South Carolina is front and center in so many conversations about this nation's relationship to slavery and ultimately this nation's relationship to people of African descent. But if we look at the early history of Carolina as a colony, it's clear that its history had both slavery and emerging forms of capitalism or what we would recognize as capitalism at its very core, at its foundation. And so to understand this relationship, we have to start in Barbados. And I know that this is a topic that Brett is in particular excited about as uh, so many of our conversations over the past few years have focused on this relationship. So the connections between Barbados and South Carolina run deep. In 1627, a small group of white English colonists with an even smaller group of enslaved Africans colonized the island uh, that would become to known as Barbados. And so after less than 20 years, Barbados was one of England's most populous colonies in the West Indies with approximately 30,000 mostly white indentured servants laboring on this island colony. By the 1640s, Barbadian planters began to experiment with sugarcane cultivation. And so this product, sugar in particular, proved to be a watershed uh, product, and it proved to be a great financial success. And so with the rise in sugar cultivation came a need expressed by wealthy planters in Barbados for a steadier source of labor. Sugar planters came to rely more and more in the 1650s and 1660s on enslaved Africans as laborers and commodities because they had a hard time recruiting white indentured servants to work in the difficult and often dangerous conditions of sugar plant of sh sugar cultivation in Barbados. And so by 1660, the demographics of Barbados shifted dramatically to approximately 27,000 enslaved Africans and 26,000 white colonists. And so the combination of the population increase, the dramatic population increase, especially of the enslaved African population, and the massive amounts of capital that investors, enslavers, and planters were making from the increasingly lucrative economy of sugar cultivation on Barbados had important and perhaps unprecedented consequences. The introduction of capitalist investment encouraged enslavers and plantation owners to buy as much land and as many slaves as possible. This also meant that because Barbados was again an island colony, there was limited space and enterprising investors could not bet their long-term economic futures on making profits in Barbados. And so eight Lord proprietors, also known as the Goose Creek Men, acquired land grants from King Charles II in 1663 
to transplant the Barbadian model of capitalist investment in land, in sugar, and in slaves to the British holdings in colonial mainland North America, specifically the land between what was Virginia and Spanish Florida. And so these eight Lords proprietors called the newly established colony Carolina. And so enslavers, slaveholders, created a colony then state where they fully supported, fully embraced slavery. And so that is to say that the colony of Carolina, what would become North Carolina and South Carolina, but mostly North Car South Carolina, excuse me, was established first and foremost for the growth of slavery as an economic and as a legal institution. And so this lasted almost two centuries. And in many ways, white South Carolinians were at the forefront of pro-slavery advocacy during this period of time. On the other hand, it was enslaved Africans transported from Barbados and from regions of Atlantic Africa who introduced their unique ideas, culture, life, and economic activity to the colony. So that is to say that, especially in the colonial period, interestingly enough, the enslaved brought with them their own ideas about how to engage in the economic life of the places where they were enslaved. Enslaved people worked the plantations growing rice and then indigo in the South Carolina Low Country. And the tens of thousands of enslaved Africans contributed to the growing Carolina economy in the 17th and 18th century. And so if we take a step back for a minute and look at the advertisement that you see here on the left, we can begin to more fully understand the relationship between slavery, capitalism, and in particular, the colonial economy of South Carolina. Um, and so if we read this here, to be sold on board the ship um, Bant Island on Tuesday, the 6th of May, uh, a choice cargo of about 250 fine, healthy Negroes just arrived from the Windward and Rice Coast. And the Windward Coast is modern day Ghana. The Rice Coast is modern day Senegal and Gambia. And so you see here, oh, interestingly enough too, I don't wanna miss out on this. Um, the utmost care has already been taken and shall be continued to keep them free from the least danger of being infected with smallpox. And so um, if I were to give another talk on perhaps the medical history of the transatlantic slave trade, which there are a handful of really amazing historians doing this, this work, we could talk about the ways in which medical knowledge was also transported by enslaved Africans. And so their knowledge of things like smallpox, for example, and in particular smallpox inoculation is a very interesting part of this kind of broader history of uh, slavery in the Atlantic slave trade. But the thousands of enslaved Africans kidnapped, sold, and bought and brought from the Rice Coast and from the um, and from the windward coast and carried across the Atlantic to the South Carolina Low Country, uh, these enslaved Africans brought with them distinct ideas about a whole host of cultivation techniques. But in particular, they brought with them specific ideas about rice cultivation. And so by 1770, most of the thousands of enslaved Africans in South Carolina were enslaved and worked on rice plantations. Uh, rice cultivation was a rigorous and a year long process that comprised between one half to two thirds of South Carolina exports in the 18th century. And so rice, low country rice, again, cultivated by enslaved Africans was the major export of South Carolina in this period. So this means that slaves uh, worked to produce one of the most lucrative products for investors, enslavers, and plantation holders in this period. Um, as tobacco became associated with slavery in the Chesapeake and places like Virginia, in the Low Country, rice and slavery were inextricably connected. Rice planting, again, was a laborious, a slow, and a methodical process that required planting, irrigation, weeding, and harvesting, all of which, again, was done, was completed by enslaved Africans. And so in a departure 
from a particular system of labor of slave labor organization that existed on tobacco plantations in Virginia. Enslaved Africans in the Low Country actually worked by a distinct set of rules that guided not only their laboring lives, but their kind of personal lives as well. And so we historians, we call this uh, the task system. And so under the task system, enslaved people were assigned a certain amount of work for the day or week based on the time of year, based on gender, age, and ability. And so when a specific task was completed, the enslaved could spend whatever free time that they had. And again, that depended on where in the year, where in the rice cultivation process they, they were. Um, they could have free time to spend as they chose, kind of within a set of boundaries. And so this type of labor system, interestingly enough, was self-regulated, which meant that the enslaved were not under the direct supervision of an overseer. And so again, tasking this type of labor organization was most prominent on low country rice plantations. And this type of labor organization ultimately shaped the ways in which enslaved communities kind of cultural lives evolved in this period. And so in the first half of the 18th century, enslavers would divide rice fields, for example, into plots that measured approximately 105 square feet and an enslaved man or woman would be responsible for maintaining this plot of land. And so this does not mean that, again, the work was not backbreaking or exploitative, because it was. The enslaved continued to labor under oppressive working conditions as enslavers were finding and creating new ways to profit off of their labor and profit off of their lives. In all of this, the economy of rice cultivation, the labor system that evolved, and the rise of South Carolina as one of the wealthiest colonies in British colonial America was a result of the influx of enslaved Africans and their labor, especially because enslaved African labor became the primary source of labor in South Carolina fairly quickly. With the founding of the colony again in 1670, there were about 30 enslaved Africans in the colony. And so if we look by 1690, the number rose to 1500, which comprised approximately 38% of the colony's population. And by 1720, South Carolina had what the great South Carolina historian Peter Wood called a black ma a majority. It is worth saying that Peter Wood's book, Black Majority, came out 50 years ago, and it has been re reissued with a new introduction by Imani Perry. And so if anyone is really interested in the history of rice cultivation here, I think uh, Black Majority is a sterling example of that. But again, um, I think looking at the Black population and the Black population as a percentage of the total population in colonial South Carolina gives us a sense of just by sheer numbers, the dominance of slavery and the visibility of the enslaved in South Carolina in uh, this, this period. And again, I wanna draw your attention to 1720 here. Um, enslaved Africans were about 70%, were a li little over 70% of the population, which is staggering. So um, out of every 10 residents of South Carolina, seven were, were black and enslaved. And so in, interestingly, if we go back to the history of rice cultivation in South Carolina, there has been some debate among historians and scholars about the origins of low country rice and the techniques that enslaved Africans used and de deployed to catapult South Carolina rice into kind of global prominence. Some historians believe that the proliferation of rice cultivation happened as a result of African slaves importing their knowledge because they were from essentially rice cultivation, rice cultivating regions of West Africa, thinking about Senegal and Gambia in particular. And so the generational knowledge that enslaved Africans brought with them was primarily brought by enslaved African women. And historian Judith Carney has 
showed us how this knowledge was transmitted over the generations. And so if we are to look at why the South Carolina rice economy was so profitable in the 18th century, we have to look at the knowledge that enslaved Africans and enslaved African women brought with them as techniques to adapt to the environment of slavery and rice cultivation in South Carolina in this period. There are other historians believe that it was European development of these very successful rice cultivation techniques. But despite this debate, um, it is clear that, uh, that it caused enslaved pe people again to become a majority of South Carolina in the 18th century. And their majority had important effects, not just for them, not just for the enslaved community, but on the trajectory of slavery in South Carolina writ large. And so that brings us to one of the first massive slave revolts in American history in the colonial period. And that happened on September 9th, 1739 with the Stono Rebellion. And so a group of enslaved Africans on that day congregated in Charleston shouting uh, liberty and shouting that they were ready to liberate themselves from the bonds of slavery. And led by an Angolan man named Jemmy, the enslaved men and women continued walking south of Charleston, recruiting more enslaved Africans along the way. By the time they stopped to rest for the night, their numbers approached approximately 100. And what exactly triggered the Stono Rebellion is again up for de debate because we scholars like to debate these questions. Um, but it was true that many slaves, many enslaved Africans knew that small group of runaways had successfully made their way from South Carolina to Florida, where they had been given freedom and land by the Spanish. And so looking to cause unrest with, within English colonies, the Spanish had issued a proclamation actually stating that any slave, any English slave that deserted to St. Augustine, Florida would be given the same treatment that they would be given freedom and land if they could successfully make it across Spanish lines. Certainly, this influenced the potential rebels and made them willing to accept the consequences, but the potential for freedom. Um, and it's worth saying again that a fall epidemic had, disrupt, had disrupted the colonial government in nearby Charleston, and word had arrived that England and Spain were at war. And this raised hopes that the Spanish in St. Augustine would actually give a positive reception to the runaway slaves, to the enslaved fugitives uh, that escaped from Carolina plantations. And so all of this is to say that um, after the uh, semi-successful re rebellion, unfortunately, it was, um, it, it was stamped down. Um, white, South white South Carolinians actually wanted to place more restrictions on the enslaved. The idea of slave insurrection was one thing, but the reality of slave insurrection was something completely different for white South Carolinians, especially enslavers. They were uncomfortable with the increasing numbers of enslaved Africans in the colony, um, and so they decided to uh, to create stronger laws that they hoped would limit the privileges of enslaved men and women. And remember under the task system, this system of labor organization actually allowed for the enslaved to have quote unquote free time. And so uh, South Carolina lawmakers in the end of 1739 started to create and think about how to strengthen slave laws to prevent further slave insurrections and rebellions. And so they created laws to quickly um, create more stringent boundaries on the freedoms, the so-called freedoms of the enslaved. And according to these set of laws that were finally ratified in 1740, the enslaved would not be allowed to grow their own food, assemble in groups, earn their own money, or learn to read. And some of these restrictions had been in effect before what we would call was the Negro Act of 1740, but they had not been strictly enforced. 
And so interesting, interestingly, it was in the aftermath of the Stono Rebellion um, that the enslaved began to become more creative, perhaps more innovative in the ways in which they would resist the bonds of enslavement. And in fact, the enslaved would continue to find ways to gather together to form their own communities and even to earn their own money. And it was enslaved people's continued efforts to create their own economic networks and to make their own money that would help support the growth of capitalism in South Carolina. And so in the Low Country, from again, from the first moments that the enslaved arrived to Carolina, the enslaved had been finding ways to trade on their own, to purchase their own goods, and in general, to make money for them themselves. And this is called the slave's economy or the economy of the enslaved. Enslaved people achieved a degree of economic independence, not freedom, but economic independence or, or autonomy by producing food, tending to their own cash crops, raising livestock, making furnished goods, marketing their own products, consuming and saving the proceeds of whatever they cultivated and bequeathing property to their descendants. And so yes, enslaved pe people took advantage of opportunities to not just possess property, but to bequeath it to their descendants. All of these activities are considered to be fundamental aspects of the slaves economy. And more directly, it was the work that enslaved people completed that was not relegated to just the production of export commodities such as sugar, cotton, and in this case, rice. But it was enslaved men and women who participated in really vibrant and interestingly visible networks of buying and selling, bartering and negotiating. And this occurred all over the slaveholding Atlantic world, especially in places like Barbados and Jamaica. But it was particularly prominent among enslaved communities in the South Carolina Low Country. And again, I think it is worth saying um, when I first started this, this project years ago, I was surprised at the extent to which I would read records, and I'll, I'll show one here next. Um, I was surprised at the extent that I, I, I would read records of enslaved people with money. They were trading, they were buying goods, often in public and often in very, very visible ways. And so that led me to really question um, not just the relationship between slavery and capitalism from the perspective of the enslaved, but it made me, it, it challenged my understanding of the relationship between embracing capitalist enterprise and freedom. And I can again talk about that in the Q&A because I think that relationship is often really fraught in ways that we are perhaps sometimes led not to question. But all of this is to say that um, the slaves economy was one other thing that the enslaved brought with them from Atlantic Africa and in particular from Bar Barbados. Enslaved men and women created economic networks in Barbados as they did in Carolina out of necessity. They were trading with free whites and servants whenever possible. And it was in 17th century Barbados where they took advantage of opportunities to develop networks of trade with anyone willing to engage with them. And this behavior was incredibly important. And so in the Barbadian 1661 slave code, for example, Slave holding lawmakers recognized the growth of enslaved Africans networks of trade. Um, and this specific law, this specific code reflected the ways that the enslaved lived and behaved during the first three decades of settlement in Barbados. And so this translates again to the ways in which the enslaved behaved economically in South Carolina. Um, and so one of the kind of let me make sure, I think I skipped this. Yes, okay. Um, and so if we look at South Carolina laws around the issue of slaves trading, the first instance of a law recognized that, hey, the enslaved are actually engaging in this type of trade and quite visibly was in 1686, a mere 16 years after the colony was founded. And the act was called an act inhibiting the trading with servants or slaves. And it said this, it said that 
no free man or free woman was allowed to buy, sell, barter, contract, barter, bargain, or exchange any manner of goods or commodities with any servant or slave. And so I find this very, very interesting for a few reasons. One, what I like to think about laws, slave laws in particular, is that these laws reflect what lawmakers are seeing and wanting to eliminate or wanting to curtail. And so lawmakers were clearly seeing this um, expansive and expanding trade between and among servants and slaves. And so they wanted to curtail this. Um, and so this was one of the first moments in which we see this arise in the law. Now, interestingly enough, not here in this slide is that there is an addendum here. It says that, um, that the enslaved could engage in this activity with the permission of their enslaver. And so if an enslaver, one, agreed to this ac activity and two, had no problem with it, then, in, then the enslaved could continue to engage in these types of activities. And so it tells me that in this period, a mere 16 years after the colony was founded, that there were enslavers who were not only completely fine with the enslaved economy, but were perhaps supporting it as well. And so all of this is to say, again, if we think about, again, laws as being a re reflection of what lawmakers and those with political power in the colonies wanting the colony to look like, um, I think it is fair to say that the laws did not work because in the 18th century, the slaves economy grew and became more a more prominent aspect of life, especially in Charleston. In particular, it was enslaved women who were at the forefront of economic activity in the city. They were the ones who were selling goods and they were the ones who were bringing their goods to the market, goods that their families were producing. And it was not uncommon, again, for their enslavers to condone these activities. And so by the 1770s, enslaved women were so prominent in the Charleston marketplace that white residents and visitors were commenting quite clearly on their presence, but they were often complaining about the influence that they wielded in these spaces. And so this piece that you see here is from the South Carolina Gazette from September 1772. And I love it because I think it, it perfectly encapsulates, I think, um, the public facing economic role of enslaved women. It says, I have seen these Negro uh, women surrounding fruit carts in every street and purchase amongst them the whole contents to the exclusion of every white person. They are your slaves who fix the exorbitant prices which are given for most of the articles that are bought at the lower market where scarcity but black butchers are in, employed. And I love this, this quote because I think, again, it gives us a sense of the work that enslaved women were doing. And it gives us a sense of enslaved women as economic actors. Um, one of the ma uh, major motivations of my work is to look at African-American economic life, but particularly dur during the period of slavery. And there are so few times when we see the enslaved as economic actors, as having an idea of what they, they were doing with money, when they were buying, when they were saving, what they were, were buying, how they understood themselves, not just as property. And I think that this is a, a quote that kind of puts that on public display. We see enslaved women who are choosing with whom to, to sell to, choosing with whom to, to trade, oftentimes using this as an opportunity to exert power and influence, choosing not to engage economically with a potential white customer. Um, and I find that this, this, again, is such a powerful reflection of the, um, of the pub, public facing uh, position of enslaved women in these economic spaces. And so specifically, uh, the, um, what the pre, uh, previous quote was referring to was the um, historic Charleston City Market. And so this is a map from 1780 um, at the confluence of the Ashley and Cooper Rivers. And this is where the, um, the market was. And so 
enslaved African women, particularly in the colonial period in South Carolina, were visible in one of the most vibrant and one of the most economically important marketplaces in colonial America. They had, again, a visible amount of autonomy in this space during the 18th century. And this autonomy, this independence, if you will, afforded them the opportunity to make money for themselves and insert themselves in a variety of economic exchanges. They were at the literal center of commercial life in this city. And they were not relegated to simply working as enslaved laborers, not simply relegated to being commodified. Instead, they were active economic participants. They were buying goods, selling wares, negotiating, haggling with customers, black and white, enslaved and free. And so all of this is to say that they were active participants in the growth of capitalism in South Carolina. And this is a picture from 1860, but I think it kind of re reflects um, the kind of economic role of the enslaved, but in particular of enslaved women. And so if we move a little bit past the colonial period, if we move past the 1790s, for example, in the late 18th century with the talk of freedom and liberty swirling around them and with the founding of the nation, enslaved people were, were encountering changes to their, their lives, dramatic changes. And this change revolved around the introduction of a product that would dramatically transform not only their lives, but really the landscape of the economic history of the, the nation. And that was American cotton, that was short stable cotton. So the economy of South Carolina was dominated at this time by slave bone rice. And rice again was the largest export of, from South Carolina. But after the patenting of the cotton gin in 1793, and with the explosion of the cotton industry at the beginning of the 19th century, South Carolina's export economy and therefore the economy of slavery and the economic lives of the enslaved shifted. And so all of this is to say that uh, cotton production increased exponentially and again, shifted the lived experiences of the enslaved. And so just a bit of data here. As you can see um, from 1790, the amount of raw cotton produced in the US was 3,135 bales of cotton and a bale of cotton is about 500 pounds. And if we go down just a little bit, um, we can see that in 1800, um, that number shifts to 73,145 bales of cotton. And then if we look all the way, way down on the eve of the Civil War, we have 3.8 million bales of cotton. And this is predominantly slave produced cotton. And so to put a finer point on this, more than half of the exports from the US, more than half of the products exported from the US in the first six decades of the 19th century, so between 1800 and 1860, consisted of raw cotton, almost all of it grown by enslaved men, women, and chil children. And South Carolina was one of the largest exporters of cotton in this period. And so the experiences of one enslaved person really shows how the introduction of cotton harvesting technologies changed the economy of slavery at the beginning of the 19th century. In 1805, one of the greatest fears of an enslaved person came true for a man named Charles, Charles Ball. His enslaver sold the then 30-year-old man to a slave trader bound for the Carolinas and Georgia's far from his family in Maryland. And Ball was funneled into the domestic slave trade during a period of dramatic economic growth. And so the introduction of the cotton gin and again, the rapid expansion that came with the uh, with the expansion of the cotton economy, in, in addition to the Louisiana Purchase that more than doubled the size of the United States, meant that the lives of enslaved men, women, and children, such as Charles Ball, um, would be swept up in this change. And so in 1837, Ball publishes his slavery in the United States after he escapes from to freedom. And he wrote that when he was in Maryland, the enslaved took on wage work, mainly at night and on Sundays. 
But when Ball reached the end of his harrowing journey on foot from Maryland to South Carolina, he noticed that the enslaved were investing more of their time and energy into earning money, much like they did in Maryland. But slavery in South Carolina was very different. Um, the sheer ubiquity of enslaved lab laborers dedicated their free time to wage labor absolutely stunned him. And so instead of spending their free time with family or cultivating community, he noticed that the enslaved were often finding ways to make money for them themselves. And so he wrote, when the slaves go to work for wages on Sundays, their employers never flog them. The practice of working on Sunday is so universal amongst the slaves on the cotton plantations that the immorality is ne never spoken of. And so he's comparing his experience in Maryland to South Carolina and saying, that he was just so surprised and shocked by the fact that the enslaved will often in, go out to work for themselves on Sunday to make money for them themselves during this period that was supposed to be their own. And so as the economy of slavery grew to include cotton as a major product, so too did cotton become an important product in slaves' networks of trade. But in a departure from what, again, Ball experienced in Maryland, these economic networks created by the enslaved grew out of necessity. And so this meant that the enslaved in South Carolina were purchasing a range of goods from sugar and molasses to coffee and rum, but they were also using their free time or their time on Sunday to buy things like clothes and shoes and hats because they were not provided with enough of these essentials to make their lives even just a little bit more comfortable. And so ultimately the enslaved continued to lack basic necessities and this was by design. Essentially enslavers start to realize that the enslaved will work more and work harder if they were paid just a little, a little bit for their extra work. And in exchange, enslavers did not have to invest the same amount of money, the same amount of capital resources to maintain their investments in slavery and in particular in plantation slavery. And so this shift, again, from the dominance of rice to the dominance of cotton, also meant a shift in the very na nature and structure of slavery in South Carolina. And what this meant, too, was that it changed the very foundations of the slaves' economy in this state as well. And so it might seem, as I thought, that enslavers would have been opposed to it any activity that would have taken their slaves' attention away from the, the cultivation of these products of cotton and of rice, um, especially given the vast profits that they were making from investments in these economies. But increasingly, especially in the 1820s and 1830s, as profits or the potential for, for profits increased, enslavers came to realize that they could squeeze more productivity out of their slaves by controlling the one aspect of their slave economic lives that had been their own, and that was the slave's economy. And so this meant that enslavers were increasingly supportive of these activities. And supportive is one thing, but they began to force the enslaved to engage in extra waged work. And so if we look at this, um, this piece from 1833, from the Southern agriculturalist, then we get an idea of how slave management came to converge with capitalism and the slaves economy. And so this enslaver writes, I never allow my Negroes to sell anything without my express permission. I never restrict them in acts of industry, but reward them punctually for their exertions by taking from them a fair price, whatever they have to justly offer. If a Negro is suffered to sell anything he chooses without an inquiry being made, a spirit of trafficking, which is a bad thing, is to be created. To carry this on means both the time are necessary, neither of which he or Wright possessed. And so we have this enslaver saying that he allowed his enslaved laborers to sell goods that they had cultivated, but only with his permission. He wanted to control that economic activity. He, not, he did not prevent them from engaging in these types of productive pursuits or money-making pursuits, um, but he was going to decide what was the just price that would be paid for their goods. 
And if he didn't intervene, if he didn't step in, then he believed that a spirit of trafficking was created, meaning a spirit of kind of illicit economic activity. And so we have this idea of the enslaved engaging in these types of activities, engaging in trade, but the enslaver increasingly, especially in the 19th century, started to believe that they needed to increasingly control the slaves economy as well. So one South Carolina enslaver described how this was done practically, and you might recognize the, the name. In June 1837, South Carolina planter, Charles C. Pinckney, he was the nephew of namesake in South Carolina Constitutional Convention delegate Charles Coatsworth Pinckney. He wrote a letter to the same magazine in which he called attention to a subject that lawmakers, he believed, had just not controlled. And that was the trade between bond and free, the trade be between the enslaved and free whites. He claimed that the laws designed to regulate trade between enslaved and free pe people had failed to be effective, had failed to do their job. He wrote that neither lawmakers nor the laws that they created could really regulate and control these types of activities. Um, and he, believed that he needed to step in and really publicize this problem. And so he actually proposed a solution. He proposed that to prevent this type of activity that he needed to start accounting for his slaves trade. And so he subsequently had an account book in which he would keep track of what his slaves traded because he wanted to be the only person to control that, that trade. And what you see here is how he kept an accounting of his slaves trade. And so this tells me a couple things. Um, one, it tells me that slaves trading was not illegal or illicit at all. If you have an enslaver as prominent as Charles C. Pinckney actually writing it down. And it meant again, that we see an increasing step of enslavers attempting to control an activity that had once pre previously been entirely or mostly controlled by the enslaved. And this means too, to me, that we often think about um, enslavers controlling the enslaved through violence. Um, but this is not inherently violent in the way that we would associate with a whip or a lash. Um, this control is different, but we might say that economic control was no less um, detrimental, perhaps, to the enslaved because it was a further stripping of their autonomy, their independence under the umbrella of slavery and under the regime of slavery. And so with that being said, um, I'll con uh, conclude here and say that in unfree markets and in my broader scholarship, um, I show that there's a clear connection be between the rise of capitalism and slavery in South Carolina, and indeed in the broader American South, especially in this period of the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, one historian contends that right before the outbreak of the Civil War, the value of almost 4 million enslaved men, women, and children in the US amounted to approximately $3.5 billion. And so the enslaved were the biggest financial asset in the US before 1860. And in South Carolina, slaves were the largest proportion of the population of any state that seceded in 1860. And so even though the outbreak of the war was a major rupture, not just for the American economy, but for the millions of African Americans who would finally own themselves, their body and their labor, we have to look at the ways in which they thought of themselves as economic actors and how they were engaging with this increasingly exploitative regime of capitalism. Um, and with that being said, Ultimately, um, we understand that slavery was an exploitative and a profitable institution, but I think it is important to look at the enslaved as economic actors in and of themselves because it helps us, I think, better understand what happens when slavery ends. And hopefully it gives us more context for these broader questions about the racial wealth gap, for example, and, and 
economic inequality along racial lines. So I will stop there. I look forward to your questions and thank you for listening. All right, and once again, uh, as always, that was a fantastic, fantastic lecture there. Thank you so much. Let's please give Dr. Justine Hill Edwards a, a warm round of applause, both for those in Grow and those on Zoom as well. And in terms of the questions, uh, what we'll do is, if you're on Zoom, please type your question in the chat. Um, and certainly, I think for the folks in the Grow Builder, you can go ahead and ask your question there, but please speak up when you do so. And there is already a question chat from early on in the lecture from Cecil Rigby, where he asked, um, of the 70.3% figure cited in 1720, did that number include indigenous slaves in South Carolina? I believe that that num a number did include indigenous slaves that were owned by colonists, yes. Um, but it is often hard, especially in the historical record in this period, to figure out the accuracy of, of that kind of breakdown. Oh, you're looking at the book. OK. <laughs> OK, and, and Cecil does have a follow up. You write on page 171 that, quote, enslavers had been failing to govern, discipline their slaves uh, for reckless exhibitions of autonomy, end quote. I love your writing style. It makes all the content highly readable. Thank you. Did anti-trafficking efforts lead to the uh, capitation taxes later? Oh, you know that I am not sure about. Mm, that is a good question. Hmm. I'm I, I'm actually not sure. I do imagine that there would have been a connection, but that I can't say de definitively. Um, but I do appreciate the comment about writing style. I think Professor Green and I can both both agree that we attempt to write for kind of a broader readership. And so I do appreciate that because that is some, something I, I think about quite a bit. So thank you. Yes, and it's something more of our colleagues should probably think about as well, but mm -hmm. I digress. <laughs> All right, so, so yeah, and a whole different conversation. So uh, Tyler Clapper asked an interesting question. He asked, uh, can you go back to the slide of the map of downtown Charleston or point me to where I can find it? Okay, the map of downtown. Sure, here, let me do a screen share again. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's go back, map of Charleston. That map right here. Um, if so, if you send me an e email, I can send you the picture and a link to where you can, can find. I don't have um, the actual web address right now, but e email me and I'll make, make sure that you get it. Fantastic, thank you. All right, so we've got a couple of questions from Jennifer Boykin in the chat. Uh, the first one is, is there any indication that the enslaved folks in South Carolina knew that they were the majority of the population? Mm, mm. That is hard to say. Um, the historical record does not tell us that, but I do think it is important to men mention that most enslaved Africans lived on plantations surrounded by other enslaved Africans, um, especially on rice plantations. And so they might have believed that there were larger numbers, whether they knew they were a majority is, is, is tough. Mm -hmm. we, we just don't have access to records where they are telling us that type of information. But again, I think, think it is worth noting that most of the enslaved lived with and near their enslaved Africans. And I think that that is important for a variety of reasons. Right, right. And uh, Jennifer Boy can ask a really good follow-up. Um, also, could you discuss your research process and any special archives you access? Oh, sure. Um, so I spent a lot of time at the South Carolina Department of Archives and History in Columbia. Um, I found the archivist there to be so friendly and helpful, and I spent months there. So 
Um, it was a second home for a period of time. Um, and then I did research at the South Carolina um, at the University of South Carolina, and they were also great. Um, I found a couple of account books that an arch archivist uh, directed me to, which was really useful, I think, in chapter five. That sounds right. Um, so yes, and so in Columbia at those two places, and then I spent a bit a bit of time at uh, the South Carolina Historical S Society in Charleston. Um, and interestingly enough, I didn't find as much as I thought I would there, um, but I think that that is just how the process works. You kind of go where you have to go and then you go where your project takes you, so. Absolutely, and I've, by the way, for folks curious, I've put links to all three of those groups in the chat as well. Um, now, Greg Howell has a question about Wade Hampton. Um, uh, what about Wade Hampton? Did he allow his slaves to trade on Sundays? Uh, he was known for keeping meticulous records on how to squeeze the most out of his slaves without actually killing them. Mm, mm. Um, I didn't find any of those types of accounting records from Hampton, um, but that is not to say that he didn't. Um, what I did for the fifth chapter of the, the book was really focus on, on accounting because I, I had been increasingly drawn to kind of accounting uh, history, which, which again is one of those, those things that when you do research, you, you kind of go where the sources take, take you. And I was incredibly su surprised that I found enslavers who were not shy about keep, keeping these types of fairly meticulous records about how they were trading with their, their slaves. And so I didn't find one from Wade Hampton, but it does not mean that he did not kind of engage economically with his slaves in this type of way. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. And I think in, in thinking about today's lecture, uh, there's a really interesting question from Eva Keith, which is how were the children of the enslaved affected? Mm. By the trading? Yeah, I think they're, like by the trading and how this economic system was working on the ground for the enslaved and enslavers alike. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, here, I want to make, make sure I can read that question too. Um, I will say that, um, I think what it meant is I think we actually underestimate again, the, the volume of economic knowledge that the enslaved had and cultivated. And so the fact that, especially in a place like South Carolina, enslaved ch children would have been seeing their parents, mem members of their uh, communities trading with one another, with their enslavers, with poor whites, going to marketplaces and, and, and trading. And so I think in many ways, um, what it meant was that they were absorbing over generations the idea that having economic knowledge and being economic actors is an important part of their lives and perhaps offered them a sense of odd autonomy within a system that was profiting off of their enslavement. Um, and so interestingly, I actually published a piece in the Business History Review last summer, where I think about um, the kind of economies of, of, of slavery through the words, through the experiences of the enslaved. And so um, I think if we look at it that way, seeing slaves as being, as having e economic knowledge, just thinking about how to make and save, save money is re really important because it means that we have kind of a fuller or more complex understanding of just the full scope of their, their lives. And that includes what ch children were absorbing as, as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I see Brett has his hand raised on Zoom. Thank you, Dr. Green. I have uh, several questions for Dr. Hill Edwards. I want to start with you told you mentioned once that Barbados, your trip to Barbados, where you thought you were going to mine the things that you were looking for, led you to South Carolina. What did you find in Barbados? You didn't mention that when you're talking about your research. What did or I didn't find? Did you find? What led you to South oh. Carolina? What kind of records were there there? Sure, sure, sure. Um, I, I actually found a lot of legal records 
because of course, I mean, I think le legal records are, are great because they kind of show us like what pops up in the historical record that gets on the radar of judges and magistrates. And so I found a lot of legal records that were trying to figure out, I think, how to mediate the, between the enslaved enslavers and like a white aggrieved party. Um, and again, it was this connection be between South Carolina and um, Barbados that really drove me to at first want to do a comparative project. But when I got into our archives in both places, um, it really occurred to me that South Carolina had such an abundance of records. Like I can't tell you just the sheer abundance of records that I found that talked about the enslaved buying eggs or selling chickens or buying livestock or trading molasses or buying tobacco or sugar, like these types of kind of mundane activities seem to me to pop up in the historical record so much. And so that's why in many ways I felt drawn to South Carolina because the records were, were there. And there were many records that I was the first person look, looking at. And so I found court cases that were kind of dockets. And so it was sealed with, with wax that hadn't been, been, been since the 1820s, which I found fascinating. And so that kind of was what drove, drew me to South Carolina and unfortunately away from the beautiful shores of Bridgetown. Mm -hmm. We got beautiful shores here too. True. Now, yes. I wanna, yes. I wanna, of course. I want to follow up still in Barbados. I'm I made up a story about the second generation um, plantation masters having grown up in Barbados. Mm -hmm. Their families become fabulously wealthy, and there's no more land when they get to be forty. Yeah. And so what to do? They look around and they say that swampy area in South Carolina and I, and this is where I, I, my story breaks down. Do you think I, who worked to deal with the Lord Proprietors? Mm -hmm. Did they just move in? Um, no, not just move move in. I mean, of course, there were political reasons. The Lords for Proprietors had political relationships with the the Crown. And if they were proposing the founding and creation of a colony to bring more wealth to the met metropole, then that was the entire foundations of the empirical project, of the, the project of empire. And since increasingly Barbados was bringing capital, right, then, then it meant that if they could make a similar pr proposal to kind of implant that same process to Carolina in mainland North America, then it, it, it wasn't a very hard sell. I mean, the crown, the, the, the crown as it manifested in Barbados and as it manifested in the North Proprietors and it was a run from London, had a hand in that. They didn't just move it up. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> my story, my story is better than that. So, uh, <laughs> one more question, I'll let you go. Um, the, um, let's see, which one? But pink, pink, that quote that you, Gave from Mr. Pinckney. Yes, I know. I know a goodly number of his relatives, both black and white. Um, it had a touch of altruism to it, mm. but it also had a touch of smart capitalist to it, which can be manipulative. Of Do you course. Have any other insight into that, the way that he articulated that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I think that, and historians are are kind of coming back around to this, but. There's been some hesitation to view enslavers and plantation owners as being capitalists because in many ways, I think in our culture, we see one being a capitalist, positive attributes get implanted onto them, right? It means that they are enterprising. They are ruthless in the best of ways, right? They are good at finding and make, making profits. And we think of those as positive things. But if we kind of then use that idea and then apply them to enslavers, it makes us comfortable. And I think it should, not with 
not be because we're talking about those who own slaves, but because we have to really think about what we mean by capitalism and capitalists. Um, and as an economic a system, I think we can all agree that capitalism thrives off of exploitation, finding small ways to exploit more profits. And that's what they they did. And I think that this is a great example, a great, but hopefully an uncomfortable example of how that functioned at a very important time in American history. Well stated, thank you. Thanks. The people in the room have a question, just make noise because I don't know they can see you. Yeah, Josh has his hand up. I don't know, we're saying such. Uh, I hope this question makes sense. Um, I guess it's a two part question. One, do you get the sense that these, you know, like trade networks of, of, of enslaved people sort of completely replicated the capitalist logic or were there other, you know what I mean? Like were there mm. other influences and in how they related when they were selling? And, and, and also, I guess, as another part of that is what was the role of this in terms of community building and, you know, connectivity? Sure, sure, sure. Well, I'll take these second question first. Um, in many ways, it was the kind of physical experience of going from a plantation to, let's say, the Charleston marketplace that helped the enslaved, especially enslaved women, kind of build larger and more robust communities outside of their plantation homes. And so it was in places like Charleston and then increasingly in Columbia in the 19th century in Beaufort, where you have kind of more robust, one might even say more politically active enslaved communities because of these types of economic activities. They were trading with one another, they were sharing information, um, especially in these port cities like Charleston, they were congregating with Black sailors when possible, again, exchanging the flow of information. And so in many ways, it was these slave economies, these networks of trade that allowed for perhaps more robust communities among the enslaved. Um, and your first question, I'm sorry, say say that again. I think I re Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's kind of a half-formed question, so hopefully you can help it make more sense. But were these, you know, the relationships and the ethics and the way in which they went about the sort of, you know, the economy, was it purely replicating the sort of you know, capitalist logic, or were there other influences? I'm thinking like maybe gift economies or other sort of influences that might have been at play. Sure. Um, I think they were adapting to the existing capitalist lo uh, logic, right? I think that, that they were not necessarily attempting to make profits, but they were trying to make their lives better materially. And so one of the assumptions that I, I had going into this project actually was that I'd find that if the, the slaves economy was so visible and, and so accepted in South Carolina, I'd find instances of the enslaved being able to make enough money to buy their freedom. And other than a handful of examples that wasn't the, the case. And so it made me kind of take a step back and think about, okay, why was I making that assumption? And then if they couldn't buy freedom, what else were they, they buying? And I found, and what, what I found was kind of more fundamental. Um, they were working to save money to buy tickets, to see loved ones at a neighboring plantation, to buy a ticket for a re religious gathering, to buy whiskey to buy uh, tobacco, to buy, again, hats and shoes and pants, right? Um, there were instances I found when an enslaved woman would buy like a silk handkerchief. Um, and so we're talking about like small luxuries, oftentimes buying this necessities. And so in many ways, I, I do think that like the enslaved were compelled to act as capitalists, but their ideas of capitalism were different than those of their enslavers. Um, and I thought that that was a really interesting way to think about the evolution of capitalism in this period, especially from the perspective of the enslaved. Thank you. Thanks for the question, it was great. 
now while we wait for more questions from the audience there are a couple of comments in the chat i want to briefly get to as well one from greg howell where he said I love the fact that you are making a connection between the current racial wealth gap and the myth that it is partly due to Blacks not being entrepreneurial. So you mm -hmm. certainly brought that up. And there is an interesting question from Priscilla Morell in the chat. Was any of the wealth of the enslaved passed down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I will say that is a fascinating question. And I'm wondering how we de define wealth. Um, are we talking about goods? I mean, we can talk about livestock. Um, we can talk about small bits of, of, of money. And so, yes, that was often be bequeathed to a child or a family mem member or a community me member. Yes. Um, and this is particularly true in the period right before the outbreak of the civil war, where the uh, the enslaved were make, uh, making actual valid claims to property that they possessed during the period of slavery. And there is a great book about this that does this far better than I do in this, this book, um, The Claims of Kinfolk by Dylan Penningroth. Um, but yeah, there were instances of the, the enslaved kind of passing down whatever they could to mem members of their family. Um, but those senses are perhaps not as abundant as we might might like. But yes, they 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 existed, and the the enslaved took it very seriously. Um, and so I'll I'll I like to re respond to Greg Howell's comment um, about the racial wealth gap and the the idea of blacks not being on entrepreneurs. It, it was the work and analysis that I did in this, this book that really shaped my understanding of this topic. Um, and so per Professor Green mentioned, but um, my, my next book is about the Freedmen's Bank is coming out in October. And this is a topic that I talk about di directly. Um, there is this, this myth, this I idea that the racial wealth gap is as pernicious as it is and has been because of African Americans inability to make, save, and main, maintain wealth. But I think if we look at this period, especially the period of slavery and immediately after, we find that that's just not true at all. Um, in fact, African Americans were cultivating very specific ways of think, thinking about wealth they them, themselves being being wealth and they were clear about what they wanted once freedom came and that was property and they worked extremely hard to earn and save money to buy property because they wanted to be able to pass land down to their ch children and so on um and so this idea that is kind of black economic inferiority that drives the race. racial wealth gap is not true if we look at this historically. And that's why I think this, this topic is so fascinating because it gives us, I think, a foundation from which to build on those types of ideas and pushing back against other ones. You know, that's so important. And I, I was actually hoping you bring up that book because I think uh, there is a definite through line of all of your work and research about this this long narrative history of of black economic both empowerment and also disempowerment at the mm -hmm. same time and mm -hmm. how it explains so much of modern black america's plight economically speaking and also politically and socially speaking too mm -hmm. um are there any additional questions, either from folks at the Grove Building or folks on Zoom? Again, if you're on Zoom, go ahead and type your question in the chat. Dr. Green, I had asked uh, Dr. Bill Edwards to make some observations about the, the notes that I found in her book that were the chapter references, that the chapters were basically um, named after or uh, individuals contributed to that chapter are the names of all our important buildings and roads in the state. Mm -hmm. Say that last part again, please. The relationship between your chapter heads and, and the names like Pinckney and mm -hmm. start naming buildings um, in, uh, on the University of South Carolina. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, um, and many universities, for example, are do, doing this now, including my my own thinking about the institutional ties that um, that we have, we brought lead to slavery. And so in many ways, I mean, the names of prominent buildings are named after enslavers, right? The names of streets are named after enslavers. Um, the names of um, communities and neighborhoods are named after slave traders. And I think that it's, um, it's fascinating to look at, but in many ways, I think it's startling, right? Because, it, because these names, these institutions and buildings are front and center. And we often don't perhaps have the opportunity to think critically about how they're, they're named for whom they're named, when they were erected and why and who's funding them. And so, um, and so take uh, taking a step back and understanding that I think is in incredibly important and it's contentious now. Um, but I think perhaps it should be because understanding the dark history of this nation should make us all uncomfortable, even though those of us who study it day, day in and day, day out. I mean, there there are days when um like my my fam family and friends, for example, are some sometimes surprised that I don't want to watch like Twelve Years a Slave, and it's hard to absorb all the time. But I think um, really understanding how our institutions, our streets, our communities are named, especially as it relates to slavery, is really important. Well, the, the place names that we use indicate who writes history mm. and it's the winners yeah and so that's why we teach the people's history here in the justice school i love that and let me just add to dr hill edwards point about being an historian and how hard this is to actually study i have a particularly difficult time viewing photographs of sharecroppers mm. because i think about the fact that in my own family tree sharecropping and sharecroppers don't go back very many generations um my, one of my grandmothers on my, my dad's side of the family, she actually worked for a long time as a domestic servant. And mm -hmm. so, again, for me, this history is not that long ago. I often emphasize that to my students as well. Both my parents grew up in a Jim Crow society. Mm -hmm. And this, again, makes the history all the more urgent. Yeah. We are really not that far re removed. Um, yeah. So. It is something that I think we need to continue to to engage with because I think as we we all know this this history is being politicized at all levels um, and hopefully with Professor Green and I our our approach to this history won't be silenced as some of our colleagues at other institutions have been. Any other questions? I think everyone's just absorbing what we've discussed this afternoon. <laughs> it was really it was really well done. Dr. Green is going to leave the class tomorrow night. And we'll be talking more about the Goose Creek Man and the evolution or the devolution, however you want to put it, of their control of the state of South Carolina. All right. Important topic. Yeah. Hello, this is Greg Howell. I, I do have a final statement. If that's okay. Go ahead. Yes. So uh, the, the issue of definitely the racial wealth gap is very important. And it's one that I have uh, increasingly become concerned of over these last two years. And so, uh, you know, this whole issue of being able, not not being able to to uh, generate wealth and, and to uh, pass it on um, is just so very important. And I just want to remind everybody, but remind everybody that as of the uh, last survey of, of uh, uh, consumer survey of finances mm -hmm. in October of 2023, that the racial, racial wealth gap between white and black 
the average at the, at the average uh, household level is one point five million dollars, mm. and uh, it's just increasing. Uh, and and reparations is so important as the the only way to uh, close the gap, not through education. Already in education, if you look at uh, a, a white family that is led by a, a person with a high school education or less, the the, the median their median wealth is. Uh, is well let's, let's go the other way the it's it's it let's say it's higher it's higher than, than a black college graduate who's, who's head of a household so um you know so education is not the solution this is just the, the, I'll, I'll end it there uh and i can't help but chuckle because greg just mentioned reparations reparations was the theme of the conference i was at this weekend uh so again i'll I'll talk more about that tomorrow before our, our Jessica Simpkins class, but uh, but yeah, Doctor Hill, would you have any any final comments for us this, this afternoon? Um, again, thank you for having me, and, and I think Greg's comment about the racial wealth gap is it's so important. I mean, in that same study, it said that the median black family holds about $45,000 in wealth while the median white family holds $285,000 in wealth. And that's such a stark gap. Um, and these questions and concerns aren't going away anytime soon. And so hopefully um, it sounds like this, this is a great form in which to continue to engage in that really important work. All right, see, Cecil has his hand raised. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I can't seem to get this little thing out of my mind here. And it kind of refers to what Mr. Howell is talking about, too. Uh, those slaves who could purchase freedom uh, and were hit with these capitation taxes that I brought up earlier, they were for. Uh, free people of color, as they like to mm. call them colloquially. And those taxes, I think, I just think it's really hypocritical that this was a tax for which they had no representation. There was no suffrage, and it was collected and levied by the very people, the veterans of the American Revolution, who came here because of that very reason. Mm -hmm. so I think the history of our state is that when we want to find a way to keep them down on the farm, we go find a way. And those capitation taxes, I think, are an important indicator of the extent to which laws uh, were made in this state to keep people in their place. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just a comment. I'd love to see some of some of those ideas addressed in your next book, if appropriate, I, I think you would know how to attack them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, that's that's a great question. And, I, and I'll just say too, I just put it in the chat, another book mm -hmm. um, called The Black Tax, written by Andrew Carl, I think who was a colleague of Dr. Hill Edwards at UVA. Yes, and, I, I actually had the pleasure of reading uh, the manuscript. And so it's it's amazing. And the Eva, you asked about the reparations conference. It was at the University of Virginia, as I mentioned at the beginning of class this afternoon. Uh, I actually met Dr. Hill Edwards in person for the first time uh, at the beginning of the conference, which was great. Um, but yeah, I, as, as we're seeing with this conversation, there is a, a growing literature uh, about this idea of not only the black white wealth gap as it is presently, but also the historical causes of that wealth gap. And again, that book, The Black Tax, I went to a, a, a forum discussion on, on Saturday, and I was alarmed by how much the book details local and, and city and state governments actively destroying the wealth of Black people through a variety of methods over the last 150 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Green, I have a last question. Or at least the last for the day, um, Dr. Hill Edwards. The the question is, when the enslaved started building wealth, there were laws against the enslaved building wealth. Were the laws ignored, or were they ever repealed? 
And is that kind of a local issue or it's a state issue of South Carolina? Um, well, again, I I think we we need to def define how we think about wealth, perhaps. Um, but there were laws against allowing slaves to possess property, for example. But the enslavers' rights often superseded with certain ca uh, caveats what was written in the laws. And that was actually stated that slaves could trade with the permission of their enslavers. Slaves could accumulate goods with the permission of their enslavers because enslavers, of course, were also um, members of, uh, they were state reps, they were state senators and so, or in the colonial period. And so in many ways, it was the enslavers who were setting and de determining the laws and they created loopholes for them themselves. And, and I think that those loopholes or caveats as I like to call them were really important in both kind of allowing this type of activity to persist but also curtailing this activity when it economically benefited the enslavers. Thank you, ma'am. It's, it's just been, it's always a pleasure to have you. You bring, you bring life to the history. Thank you so much for the invitation again. <laughs> yes, we are much appreciative. And as a reminder, of course, we have our next Jessica School session of class number two tomorrow. Well, we'll be discussing more about the Goose Creek men, uh, the Revolutionary War era in South Carolina, and the Constitution as well. And the, of course, positive impact that South Carolinians had on the U.S. Constitution. And I hope you can hear the sarcasm in my voice. <laughs> but again, thanks to everyone who attended this afternoon. Uh, these deeper dive discussions are always incredible. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, Dr. Perlina, and Dr. Perlina. Thank you for a wonderful session. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the invitation. Have a good rest of the night. Bye you bye. too. Well, I will have the great midterm, so we'll see. <laughs> have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> bye. Have a good one.